Hello, welcome back to Animated Literacy. This is part 18 of the overview and research. And in this section, we're going to be talking about multi-sensory instruction and about integrated curriculums. Before we go into what that looks like, I want to talk a little bit about what multi-sensory teaching is not. When we first started talking about the senses and, and how you can learn through your tactile kinesthetic, your eyes, your ears, by smelling, by tasting, and all these different ways. Rather than people looking at how many senses we could use, many started talking about modality matching. And this is a quote that came out of Best Practices for Literacy Instruction back in 2011. And here they're saying a teacher may select strategies from different learning theories to provide balance. One child, for example, may be a visual learner and benefit from sight word instruction. Another child may be an auditory learner and will benefit most from phonics. This is not what multisensory learning is about. First of all, we know through the research I've already presented that those children who learn to read by sight generally hit a wall at fourth grade and have that fourth grade slump. So we don't have some people read, reading by sight and others reading by context and others reading by phonics. Um, the people who do the best use phonological awareness as their foundation. What we're looking at is looking at using all of our senses. But also, as we're looking at this, you can't forget all of the other things. I started out many years ago using multi-sensory instruction to teach letters and to teach letter sounds. And we had sandpaper letters, we drew the letters in the sand, and we do, did all of these kinds of activities that were considered multi-sensory. But what was miss missing was there was no context, there was no emotion. So we were teaching these parts that didn't have much interest, that were very boring. And we talked about the brain is only as smart as it needs to be. And if the environment is boring, the brain shrinks. If there's no emotion, the children don't pay attention. If there's no context, it's like giving you the parts of a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle without showing you the box. And you don't know how they relate to the whole. So you have to keep all of these things in mind at once and multisensory instruction is just one piece of that. And this is a quote from Ian Robertson who um, wrote the book Mind, Mind Sculpture. And he tells us that all the stimulation in the world will not sculpt the trembling webs of your brain unless you pay attention to that stimulation. So we have to have emotion, but we still need a multisensory environment to do that in. And he tell, also tells us, because he works with people with brain injuries and strokes and so forth, he says how well people can pay attention just after a right brain stroke predicts how well they can use their left hands two years later, because the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body. So attention has everything to do with it. So we need to have that emotional connection when we're doing our multisensory instruction. This is a quote from Celebration of Neurons from Robert Sylvester. And he tells us when objects and events are registered by several senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, they can be stored in several interrelated memory networks. A memory stored in this way becomes more accessible and powerful than a memory stored in just one sensory area. So rather than saying, well, this is a visual learner and this is an auditory learner and this is a kinesthetic learner, and trying to teach each child through that one sense that's considered their strongest, we need to try to teach all children through all of the senses. Sometimes it's hard to access your smell and vision. In virtually every lesson, we can access our kinesthetic tactile senses, our vision, and our hearing, but it's not always possible to access our sense of taste and smell. However, there are some characters in animated literacy that can do that. Here we have Lizzie Lamb and she's lying on a pillow of lemon leaves and you can taste the lemon, you can hear the lemon squish, you can feel the lemon, and you can smell the lemon. So there you can bring in all of your senses. And the same with Crazy Camel as she's crunching her cookies, candies, and cakes. Um, because here again we have taste and we have smell whenever it comes to food. But you can't always bring in your taste and smell, but you should bring it in whenever you can. 
Now the next piece with this that's critical though in order to make it work is how you go about accessing all of those senses. And sometimes people will set up centers where they'll have a different sensory area for each centers. And children will go to this center to taste things and this center to smell things and this center to, that is movement and kinesthetic and this center for listening and this center for, um, for hearing. If you do each of these things separately, it won't have the same effect. A favorite saying of brain researchers is, cells that fire together, wire together. So instead of doing each of these things separately, if you can do them all simultaneously, or at least in a very close um, time frame together, then what will happen is there will be connections between each of your sensory areas. So if you can activate your kinesthetic at the same time as you activate your hearing, those two centers will link together. If you add your tasting at the same time, that will link in. If you add your vision, that will link in. Now, if it comes to a later time, any one of those senses gets activated, then like a chain reaction, all of the senses that learned with it will fire. But the reverse of this is also true. They, um, brain researchers like the bottom statement you see down here, where it says, cells that fire apart, wire apart. And in his book, Mind Sculpture, Ian Robertson tells us why it is that the brain has to have two separate ways of wiring up. There are some children he talks about who are born with what's called a webbed finger syndrome. So their fingers are like in a fist like this and there's tissue connecting them. And because there's connect tissue connecting, if they touch something over here with the little finger, it's also felt over here with the index finger because everything is connected. Now to show you the neuroplasticity of the brain, they developed an operation where they can separate the fingers. Now, within a month's time, he tells us the brain will reorganize itself so that if you touch something with your little finger, you'll no longer feel it in your index finger because each of those fingers will have a separate area in the brain for taking in those senses. Now, that's important if you're doing your sensory areas. You need to know which area is touching something. If it's hot and you touch it with your index finger and you feel it, or with your little finger and you feel it in your index finger you wouldn't need know what to remove from the fire so this is why you have two separate ways of wiring up but when it comes to learning we need children to wire all of these things together when we're teaching literacy so this way if they see a picture of Lizzie Lamb and they have tasted the lemon and they've touched the lemon and they've smelled the lemon and they've seen the visual of Lizzie Lamb and they've heard Lonnie Lion laughing and they have the the picture of the L right next to it as to how you spell it now they see that L all by itself and all of these other things come into play so they're able to remember the sound of L much better. Advertisers use this constantly. This is an example where um, Yugo is probably one of the least motivating cars for guys to purchase. So if they put a pretty girl next to the car and they place that girl next to the car over and over and over again, what will happen is those visual images will link up and now at a later time the guy sees the car there's no pretty girl there but he thinks gee if I buy that car maybe there will be a pretty girl and so they may end up with a sale we're doing the same thing in animated literacy when we're teaching letter patterns and we're starting to write those words when we write claw I write the AW and now the children see the picture of the claw and we can talk about clawing and make it kinesthetic. Then later they see the AW and there's nothing else around it, but they remember that context of the AW next to the picture and they can start to learn all of those letter patterns much faster. You can see the th same thing taking place here where we have Ike on his bike and we have all of these spelling patterns next to Ike. Now as the children are writing, if they can hear the sound of I and they can gesture the sound of I and they need that, that sound for the word that they're writing, they can simply go to the chart and choose one of these to write it with. Now at first their spelling will be Shakespearean spelling that we talked about. 
But if they see that word printed the same way over and over and over again with the same spelling, eventually they'll start to use conventional spelling. Now as we're bringing this in, we can also bring in all of our other areas of the curriculum. So when Baby Barnaby was introduced, we talked about balancing, we talked about the bumblebee over here that he bumped into, we talked about the banjo and the band, and we can talk about Boston, and all of these various things. Also, as we're introducing each of the lessons, we access our prior knowledge by asking children what they already know about that, and then we read books that adds to that prior knowledge. And as that prior knowledge is being input, we can later start to get output. And I showed you this picture in another lesson where now we're teaching about Baby Barnaby so that the children learn the sound of Baby Barnaby, but included in Baby Barnaby's story is a lot more than just teaching that sound. We have all of these different topics that we have written about. And so when Baby Barnaby was introduced, we talked about babies, we talked about bouncing, we talked about balancing, and we um, read books and input factual information about each of those topics. Now in this particular one, after the child had done their puzzle for Baby Barnaby, now they're developing their word recognition because they're having to look at those words over and over again. They're also learning punctuation and capitalization because they're learning if, it, if the word starts a sentence, you need to have a capital at the beginning. If it's at the end of the sentence, you need to have a period. So they're learning all of those conventions of print in a very integrated setting. And then they're given a choice of choosing whatever topic that they want to write about. And this child chose the topic of bumblebees. And so on her paper, she writes, bumblebees can sting you, and some people are allergic to bumblebee stings. Bees sting because they are bo you are bother them, and bees die when they sting people. The end. So rather than what happens in a lot of cases where um, I know there have been times when we had a program called clinical teaching and we were required to turn in lesson plans where every lesson had one topic and one objective and at the end of the lesson rather than creating emotion and a context for that one thing we were supposed to teach we were to begin every lesson by saying boys and girls at the end of this lesson you will be able to and then we spend the entire lesson teaching to that and a lot of this kind of instruction has centered around teaching to the test where we've used um, materials that look exactly like the test to teach the skills that are on the test. What we need to do instead, I'm advocating, is we need to teach in an environment that has emotion, that has context, that has multi-sensory learning, that has accessing of prior knowledge. And so we have this, and, and all of the arts being brought in. So you're, you're drawing it, and you're singing it, and you're moving to it. And when you do all of those things and you do them simultaneously then you get your, this uh, idea of the cells firing together wiring together and you also get transference when you teach everything separately the brain may learn all those things but it may store them all in separate boxes and then when one box is opened it doesn't open the other boxes and there's no transference so when we're first teaching things we want this kind of an integration then we do need to show children how to take a test. So if we spend nearly all of the year teaching in an integrated environment, then a few days before the test, or maybe a week or, before, or two before the test, you bring out materials that are not from the test but look like the test so that you can teach them how to transfer the information they've been learning all year to the test and when that happened in my classroom, that's when my test scores jumped from fewer than 20% of my kids at the 50th percentile in reading to nearly 70%. So teaching to the test has not produced higher test scores, but teaching children how to learn lots of information in an integrated environment and then teaching them how to apply that test will produce higher test scores. So another example of this, with Polly Panda. Here's Polly Panda, and she's parachuting to the playground. So we can talk about the science of how a parachute slows you down as, as you're coming through the air. Then she's painting. So we can talk about the pigments and, and how to mix colors and, and what, what do you need to do if you want a purple? What colors would you mix together in order to be able to get that? 
then as the, the, ch the characters are being introduced, you're reading expository text about them. And, and Gail Gibbons is one of the top children's authors of expository text. So before telling the story of Polly Panda, we read the book Flying by Gail Gibbons, which tells us that people have always wanted to fly. Years ago, the first balloon to carry passengers was tested in France. It carried a duck, a rooster, and a sheep, and they all landed safely. So what do you think the rooster was saying up there in the sky? Oh, cock-a-doodle-doo. Well, what do you think Mimi Mermaid's rooster might say? mock a moodle moo What do you think the sheep said? Ba ba. What would Nellie Newt's sheep say? Na na. Um, what do you think the duck said? Quack quack. What would Mimi Mermaid's duck say? Mac mac. So we can pause for a moment and do a bit of phonological awareness. And the more frequently we do this, and the more in context we do this, the better the transformation. The the transfer will be, the more emotion is going to be involved, the more context will be there, and the better the brain will be able to process and transfer that kind of information. And then we have a writing lesson where children either tell me how they are like Polly Panda or how they are not like Polly Panda. And I shared this example before. The child writes, I like to paint a beautiful heart. And here you see how she has the sounds that she heard in beautiful. And this was a child who began the school year not speaking a word of English. And she has some accents, so she might hear those sounds a little differently than we hear them. And her Shakespearean spelling may look a little different than a child who has English as their only language. Now we need a place to use that. So we're going to go into a pattern song that has to do with chasing. So we can ask children to tell us, well, have you ever been chased? Have you ever chased someone? In Farley Fox's story, who is he chasing? Oh, he's trying to catch fish. Why does he want to catch fish? Well, he wants them to feed his family. And what's he doing while he's fishing for those fish? Oh, he's playing the fiddle. And, and what's Lizzie Lamb doing? Oh, she's here resting. And who's behind her licking his lips? Lonnie Lyon. So now we can start to talk about chasing and food chain. And here's a story that my children dearly love that is extremely simple that gets into the idea of chasing and it's called Blue Sea by Robert Callan. And it reads like this, Blue Sea, little fish, big fish. What does little fish need to do? Oh, swim little fish. Why does little fish need to swim? To get away from big fish so it doesn't become his meal. Now we can go into more sophisticated books as we're doing this. So every lesson has opportunities to integrate curriculum through our read aloud. <coughs> so here's one that's titled, What Do You Do When Something Wants to Eat You by Steve Jenkins. And he tells us when an octopus is threatened, it squirts a thick cloud of black ink into the water, confusing its attacker. If a puffer fish is in danger, it takes in water, swells up like a prickly balloon, making itself almost impossible to, sw to swallow. So you can have a lot of very clever ways of writing um, nonfiction text. Then after that, we can go into rewriting I Caught a Fish Alive that I showed you earlier. So we can have the kids track the words. So now they're going along and doing one, two, three, four, five. I caught a fish alive, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I let it go again. But if on the back of our paper, we've not drawn a, pit, a fish, but a pup, now I can say to the kids, um, we drew a pup on the back, so what can we replace the word fish with? And now they all write their word pup inside their circle, and then they need to generate the picture from the text so that when they get to fourth grade and there's no more pictures in their books, they'll know how to form pictures in their mind. Here, as a step, as a scaffold towards that, instead of just you painting the picture in their mind, they're actually forming the picture on their page. And so here's the child, uh, the child picture, and it's real small over here, and she's catching the pup in her picture. This also works for multiple intelligences from Howard Gardner. One of the presenters that was doing workshops in Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences used our character of actress Annie as an example how you can stimulate all of Howard Gardner's intelligences that he lists um, just through this one character's lesson. And so I want to show you a little bit of how you can integrate some of your math instruction with 
the character for actress Annie. So first of all, when we were doing our I Caught a Fish Alive, we counted from one to ten. One, two, three, four, five. I caught a fish alive. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I let it go again. And then as we were, were doing our frame, we've got all of the numerals that that we're counting and we're pointing at. And we have another frame that has number words instead of numerals so that the kids can start to learn those. So now we have counting from one to 10. Now we can start to form sets. So um, let's say we are going to form a set of living things. So our fish would go in that set. How about our package? Nope, so we still have one in our set. What about our pig? That, that can go in our set of living things. So we had one. If we add another one, and actress Annie likes to add, so here's her sign. Now one plus one equals how many? Two. How about a baseball? Is that going to go in our set of living things? No, so that one go, needs to go over here. So how about a puppy dog? Yep, so now we had two. And if we add one more, how many is two plus one equals three altogether? And now we have a shark. So would our shark go with our living or anomaly? Oh, with our living, okay, so we had one, two, three. And if we add another one, now how many do we have all together? One, two, three, four. So three plus one equals how many? Four. Now let's say we want to change our set. Let's say we add another attribute and we go, well, let's do things that live in the water. Does the pig belong now? No, we need to take the pig away. Does the shark belong? Yep, the shark still belongs. Does the fish belong? Yep, we still have that. And does the pup belong? No, nope, puppy doesn't belong anymore. So how many did we take away? We took away the pup and we took away the pig. So altogether we had four, but if we take two away, how many are left? Two are left. So four minus two equals how many? Two. So now we've taught subtraction, subtraction with our lesson. Now we can extend it to set formation. So I'm going to make a set and I want to see if you can tell me which element comes next and what the attributes of my set are. So I'm going to start my set with a fish. Then I'm going to put a package. Then I'm going to put a pup. Then I'm going to place a baseball. What do you think would come next in my set? The airplane? or the pig. Let's see if we can figure out what our set is. So our set goes living, non-living, living, non-living. Non so what would the next have to be? Living, so would we choose the pig or would we choose the airplane? The pig would come next. Now we can talk about that's an ABAB set. Now we could form AAB, AAB sets. And after I did this, I found when my kids went to their activity time, they were going and collecting toys and making strings of things all around the classroom. And they're coming up to me and going, Mr. Stone, can you guess my pattern? And sometimes they had a pattern and I could guess it. Other times they didn't have a pattern. So I go, oh, well, yours isn't a pad pattern. Yours is random. Then I had kids going, oh, mine is a, B, A, B, random, A, B, A, B, random. So we're learning a lot more of our math. Then when we were reading books to get into labeling with our adjectives, my favorite book to start out with was Fuzzy Yellow Ducklings. And it goes like this. It reads, fuzzy yellow circle, fuzzy yellow ducklings, bumpy brown triangle, bumpy brown toad. So we have a triangle, we have a square, we have an oval, we have a rectangle, we have a crescent, and we have a line. Now after we've read that story we and talked about the shapes, then we can draw a picture like we did with our pup and our man and, and so forth. And then we can label the parts of our picture and now all of these adjectives came from that book and we can use all of those adjectives for describing our picture and moving to two word phrases. 
So th these are some of the kinds of things that you'll see as we start to go through the lesson plans that animated literacy is a highly integrated approach that is bringing in emotion and context and prior knowledge all to be able to motivate children to pay attention and to understand how all of the parts of language fit together. Then it's bringing in all of the, uh, the subjects through read aloud and through discussions um, so that that's integrating. And it's not doing this all separately through separate centers, but it's doing them all at relatively the same time so that we get the concept of cells that fire together, wire together, so that just like the advertising agencies are doing, when a child sees one element from that lesson, all of the other elements from that lesson come into play at one time and they are able to remember it better and be able to transfer it to their other learning opportunities. So thank you again for joining me and I will look forward to seeing you in the next session.